Welcome back to the No Mulligans <laughs> podcast. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that was a good Dude, start. That was so good. Like, I'm just watching your profile when you did that. I was like, Tate, you're going to want to cut right here in three seconds. <laughs> and then we were back. <laughs> and we're back. That's my, like, we're live yeah. face. <laughs> and we're live here from the back porch of Franklin Bridge. Yeah, but uh, Jack and Scott here. You guys know us already. If you don't, uh, what are you doing? You need to be listening to the Mo- No Mulligans podcast. Mo Nulligans. <laughs> Sometimes I'll speak too fast. The Mo Norman happens, podcast. But, Wait a um, no, we really appreciate you guys listening wherever you guys are listening. If you're on YouTube, thanks so much. Make sure to give this thing a thumbs up. Pause right now and make sure you do that. Ready? I'm going to wait for you. All right. You probably should have done it by now. Anyway, wow, this is a silly start here. Silly start to this podcast. Hey, that's all right. But okay we appreciate you guys you. listening. Uh, we are on YouTube. So if you guys want to check out the new couch furniture, uh, outdoor patio furniture we have here at the back porch of Franklin Bridge, it's an awesome time to come check it out. We're going to be recording here in the summer when the weather's nice twice a month. So every, every other, every two weeks, every other week. Wednesday night, 7 o'clock. Whenever you get paid, come out here to the Franklin Bridge to spend your hard-earned money on some of Tevin's tacos. Or what we were talking about with John during the intermission here. We're talking about some make your own pizzas. Tevin recently got this cool pizza oven that's portable and like you can set it on a table. Yeah. And we'd have something out here where you pay X amount of dollars and you can make your own pizza bar while you listen to the No Mulligans podcast. That would crush <laughs> Dude, here. That sounds so good. I might not even be on my own podcast. I might just go eat the pizza. Just go eat the pizza. <laughs> right. <laughs> There's a lot of cool things happening, though. Uh, last announcement before we get into the nitty-gritty of things is uh, play with the pod. We are going to put a – Scott, remember this. We're going to put a post out on Instagram okay, with all of our uh, dates that we're going to be doing play with the pod. Ooh, it's going to look like uh, touring dates. For exactly. Like it's going to look like the – we can call it the Franklin yes. Bridge Tour <laughs> or the FBPI Tour. That's right. Uh, no, but if you guys want to come along and play with me and Scott at some pretty cool courses here around the region, we've talked about – uh, going up to Indiana, going down to Birmingham, uh, potentially going to... We're going to Ohio, and we've already got yep. somebody committed to go to Ohio. Yep. Got and one group. We're also more. talking about potentially, towards the end of the golf season, going to maybe Pinehurst. So we'll see how the finances look with all that, but that's definitely yep. a uh, situation that we want to be a part of. So, And we want you guys to be a part of it. Come out. The bridge doesn't really have any kind of touring thing where we go and play at other places. Long pause. Tate, you can cut there. Places. And it's uh, it's just a great opportunity for uh, us to get out of our home course and go uh, test our game on other cool places around the country. So yeah, and I we're think- going to kind of take you through my backstory a little bit. That'll be kind right. of this fall, this summer-fall journey will right. be the kind of some of the things you've heard if you've been a long-time listener. Like right. You'll hear some of the courses that I got to grow up playing on, some of my highlights, some of my lowlights. Some but of my no lights. The other thing, too, is how many of you guys, and this is obviously a rhetorical question here, but like how many of you guys listening right now play at Franklin Bridge? You know exactly where to hit the ball because you know what all of the greens do. And then you go play in another course, and like that's the reason why all these guys play, play practice rounds, right? It's because you got to know where to hit the ball. So it's a great opportunity for you guys to test your game, test your skill, have me and Scott there to be able to talk with you about anything that you need to know when you're playing. So I think that's a, it's a great opportunity join for us. you to come and join. It's basically like have fun. Come drink some drinks. You know, Scott's going to be here. If you guys need any last-minute swing tips, you can get on the range. Scott will be That's here right. to, we'll like, be. iron you out before you get on yep. the tee. So yep. it's a great opportunity for you guys and, and really hope you can you can make it to at least one date. I'm, so. rub- I'm rubbing off on you. You're getting long-winded. This maybe is I'm, good. Maybe I'm just, like, silly towards the end here. You know, it's like the back, it's it's the back half tired. of the night. Back half of the night. Yep. Uh, we're here just maxing and relaxing. And then uh, got this yeah, guy, what, too. Yeah, tell me about this uh, – this weird looking golf ball that's got a bunch of stitches on it. Got red seams and it's on really it. Really um, big. Well, the backstory to this is that Scott had a uh, had a student and um, he was asking him to throw a ball. And I kind of want you to explain this story about why you had him throw the ball. And uh, if you guys know me, I, I played baseball back in the day um, at a pretty decently high level. So um, I've got a lot of experience with this thing. And I think it's, it's one of the main reasons why I've gotten so good at the game of golf in such a short amount of time as well. So, Scott, I want you to explain why you had this student start throwing the ball and then why you had me bring this ball here to the podcast. So one of the, um, one of the most basic tests, right, you have what we call sports skills. So <clears throat> you have uh, fundamental movement skills uh, and you have 
sports skills, fundamental sports skills that go along with that. Well, throwing is a fundamental sports skill, right? The ability to throw something. Uh, you have striking is a fundamental sports skill. Um, you have like a fundamental movement skill would be running, sprinting. Uh, kicking would be a fundamental sports skill, right? Dribbling would be a fundamental sports skill. So like those are hand and eye coordination related movements, um, <clears throat> various things. And a throw is actually one of the most complex. That and striking are two of the most complex fundamental sports skills. So, And ironically, too, you have a striking part and a throwing part in the same sport, which I think is unique. You only see that in baseball and cricket probably for the most right, part. Right, right. Um, Hockey's close, but not quite the There's same. There's no throwing in hockey. Right. So um, Unless you're throwing a punch. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Yes, I got a joke. <laughs> um, but, uh, no, it's – I had a trainer. Uh, if you want to kind of follow him and his company, they do some really cool stuff. Uh, he's super knowledgeable on how the body is supposed to move um, and relating it to golf. Um, he's not a golf instructor, but a lot of his content would seem like he is. Um, he's a kind of a movement expert. Um, you could look up E track on Instagram, E T R A K. Um, and some of his knowledge is fundamentally like phenomenal. So he said to me one time when I was back in Birmingham, he said, Scott, golf is a game of throws. Like it's throwing. It's just, you don't let go of the object well, and there's that also, you're going to throw. There's also a reason why when you're hitting wedge shots, a lot of the, you know, a very popular term is throwing darts, right? <laughs> yeah, it's funny that we use that term. That's kind of neat. Um, but <clears throat> it's really interesting. I was actually watching him on Instagram I don't know, two or three days ago, and he was talking about, like, down at the bottom, you have these people that this right arm and hand goes out like this. Now, some of that's just because they haven't been trained. They just don't know how to do the right movement. Um, but he was also talking about from a muscular standpoint, like what allows you to throw effectively is the ability to control other muscles well in your back. So the right, the scap needs to be retracted and pulled down. There's like a lot of movements back in the shoulder for you to be able to accurately throw a ball. So, and square up the club face down on impact. So it was really interesting to see how he brought those dynamics together. So if I have a kid who just, you know, we look at people and go, oh, he's so unathletic. Now, I don't define athletic in the way most people do, but when a student looks unathletic, they are unable to control and manipulate their body um, quickly and effectively in, into a new movement pattern. So somebody who's athletic is able to change their movement patterns very quickly and achieve a desired objective, not just from the body movement standpoint, but from the outcome that's desired, whether it be bowling, a strike, or catching a spare, whether that be throwing a ball accurately to a baseman, whatever. So <clears throat> that, to me, is what athletic looks like. So when you have a kid that looks unathletic, they look out of control of what their body does. Right, And when you ask them to change, that change is very difficult for them to do because they lack a lot of these skills. The throw is the largest combination of all of the skills. There's a step and a release which has kicking parameters in it. Uh, there's a throw here which combined with accuracy has a striking component to it. Uh, there's a sequencing component to it. So in order to throw effectively, accurately, and powerfully, like you have to be able to stride those movements in order. There's so much that's involved in a throw that if that skill is weak, you kind of have to train that skill, especially when they're a kid. Um, so we had this young man um, that Jack had seen before in a lesson, and then I asked him, I was like, Jack, I need you to come teach this kid how to throw some other time. Well, it happened to be a podcast day he was signed up for. Jack was there. I was like, Jack, can you like, can you take a few minutes to show this young man how to throw a ball? And he said, yeah, sure. Like, I know it seems silly. Like, this kid's 13 years old, and he can't throw a ball effectively. He looks so awkward throwing it. And you feel bad for the kid, right? Like, he's trying to swing a golf club and going, goodness. Like, Great this student. Is, Great oh, student. He's a wonderful student. Wonderful kid. Um, like honestly, how bad of a shape he was in. I've taught a lot of kids where like start where he is and give them about two months and they're out. Even if they're coming every week, twice a week, they just like, it's so difficult for them to go from not being able to do a basic skill like throw or catch 
to being able to swing a golf club effectively and swing it well. His swing looks really good right now. We've kind of finalized the last big fundamental piece, and he's been coming to me for six or eight months. And so Jack got in and started teaching the kid how to throw, and it was so cool to see, like, I was struggling to get him to do something. First time you'd ever seen me throw something, too, by the way. Yeah, other than just, like, a, hey, toss me a ball real quick. Like, right, 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 right. Like but a like more actually, dynamic actually throw, movement. Yeah. yeah, and so we're throwing golf balls on the driving range. And I was like, Jack, can you show this kid how to throw a ball? And I'm struggling to, like, teach him the understanding, the connection between the two. He's practicing this. Like, he's throwing balls at the house against the wall and things like that just to try to get caught up and was still trying to like the ability to lag the arm behind the rest and not just like it just all kind of moves like one big thing. Like there's no sequencing, there's no order to anything. That's really hard to teach. And I, I just know how to throw because I grew up playing every sport. And if you don't learn, you, you get left behind. Well, and here's the other thing too, like, and this is not me boasting on myself. It's just me being playing baseball my whole life. Is like you can also see the difference between your throw and my throw, too. The same Completely. way. Yeah. And and I, I wrote this down in my notes because I didn't want to lose it here. I, I related as far as like the sequencing, the throw, everything about my motion compared to your motion compared to the student's motion was uh, – I, I wrote down here in my notes, I said, compression of the golf ball and whip of the throw, right? Mm. You can throw the ball, right? And that's probably going to be like an off-center strike. It's still decent. It's probably still going to get to the target, right? Right. His, it's somewhere on or near the green. His throw is a thin knock that, like, skirts up to the green, and you're like, well, it got there, but not skillfully. On, on a good one. Right, on a decent one, right? And on and the like, average one, correct, it's like, whoa. Correct. Ooh, it's one of like, he. when you're playing with your buddies and he hits one and you're like, I don't know how that got there, but it did. Good, good job. Let's see if you can knock this one over birdie. And then you go to my throw, and my throw, and certainly there's people who can throw better than I can, but like my throw is like watching Micah Stangby out here right. dart and iron. Right, it's just right. feel. Ding, it just ding, looks ding, different. Ding, it feels ding, different. Ding, you can ding. you can hear the spin off the ball. Yeah. And what's yeah. interesting, and I grew up playing catcher, and caught a lot of. You have to learn to throw quick. Yes, and but I caught a lot of pitchers who can throw even better than I can in some ways, right? And yep. Even at the at the collegiate level, right? So, y you'll hear when a guy who throws ninety plus miles an hour, and you're sitting behind there, and you're in your catcher's equipment with your glove up, ready to catch the ball. You can hear the seams of the ball penetrate the air and make the same sound that a golf ball does when it comes off a club. It goes, pew, pew, and you can hear it every single time, and then it pops the leather, and that's why everybody loves baseball. It's because it's the most like satisfying sound that you can hear in, in the entire world, just catching on the, on the leather. But I say that to say is that there is levels to every single motion, right? And Correct. so if you're this student and you can learn how to throw a ball, well, now what have we learned? We've learned how you can feel things in your fingers. We've learned where to feel your body in space, right? Like, so, like, even the way you're holding the ball, if I was holding it, like, if I was doing that, like... I have the ball. It doesn't, it doesn't like, there's, there's a difference in how you and I hold that. Oh, yeah. And there will always be a difference in how you. So and I you're hold that. you're you're holding it kind of like and in, then, and in your hand, right? Yeah. So like all for those of you who are listening, like I'm all my, all three four fingers are on the ball, right? Yeah. And even when you throw it, like you'll come back here and you'll you'll still have I'll the ball facing your target, right? Yeah. The difference for me is I have two fingers. I have three fingers on my ball: my thumb and my two, my index finger and my middle finger. Elijah throws this way. I saw it the other day. I was like, you're what? Like, what? So like, he grew up playing a lot of baseball. Yeah, and so it's called a four seam grip, right? And the ball is facing away from me right it's the can same you feel reason that in the glove when you go to grab it out of the glove um, absolutely. can you shift it in your hands absolutely you and it's totally un <laughs> that's so cool and it's totally unconscious too right like i would have to think about how to get like oh, okay uh, okay now throw it here I'll, i'll have you do this you're gonna place this ball in any orientation i'm gonna have my eyes closed and i'm gonna get it to a four seam grip as fast as i possibly can okay all right ready go done and it's even quicker in real time too There it is again. My eyes are still closed. Random order. There it is again. Where is it? <laughs> that was cool. There it is again. One more time. Oh, oh you dropped uh -oh. it. Uh-oh. It's gone. It's gone. We got it. Huh. One more time. 
Well, that was a slow one. Whoa, that was a that real, was a real slow, slow one. That was a, there you go. There's a quick one. Yeah. And the crazy thing about this is even when I get it in my hand, so uh, sorry if this is not translating on audio. I'm really trying to do my best here. So in ca- when we're catching, we have this thing called a pop time, right? When a runner is stealing from first to second, right, we need to throw them out as quick as possible. So they're running when the pitcher starts his throwing motion, okay. and I have to throw him out before he gets to the bag, right? And so the ideal pop time for a collegiate catcher or even a major league catcher is going to be sub two seconds from the time the ball pops in my glove at home plate to the time where it pops in the second or shortstop's mitt at second base, it's going to be sub two seconds. And that throw for people watching, if you're watching on TV, it doesn't, you're like, oh, he threw it to second base. Congrats. That throw from first to third or from home to second is approximately 50 to 60 yards. And we're getting it down there from our glove, transferring it into the person who's catching it down there 50, 60 yards away in sub two seconds. That's moving, bro. And so when this thing hits, you see if you can. Uh, um, so I'm gonna do this. Y'all so like this backup, is actually a good, y'all this, like backup pitchers. This is actually a, yeah. This is actually a really good analogy because I'm I'm close to my body. So our goal is to receive this thing as close as we can, still framing it to be a strike, transfer it to our hand, and get it out of our hand as quickly as possible, right? And so what we have to do is we have to catch it find that four seam grip and then throw it down as fast as we can. Sometimes it's so quick to where we're trained to where I can throw this ball in any orientation. It doesn't have to be in the four seam grip. I can throw it. I can throw it like this. I can throw it like this. I can throw it like this. But the fun thing about baseballs and that you get this in more in pitching is that the seams change the curve on the change ball. the curve on the ball. Right. Same way that like the way that we strike an iron changes the way our ball flight right. goes. Right. So, um, just the more you know. So this is a very fundamental movement, and it's the same way. The way that I can throw is the same way that I can feel lag in the golf swing, and I can't explain it. I can't no, explain it at all. I don't need you all. to explain it. You just need to understand. But it's the way it. that I feel the lag of my hand and that release point, right? It's the same trust that I have when I'm bringing my handle through and knowing that that head of the golf, the head of the golf club, is going to hit the ball. Right. Like I could ask you right out of the gate. I want you to hit me a, a pull draw in our first lesson, and you can do that. I could not mm. ask this kid to do that. Mm. Even if he knew what a pull was and a draw was, mm-hmm. there's no chance he can execute that with any amount of repeatability. Well, you know what's interesting, too, if you give me the ball here. So when you asked me to hit a pull draw and when I wasn't, uh, when I, you know, wasn't as skilled as I am now at golf, I can, I can throw you a pull draw. And in that same, right. and in right. that same right. sense, I'm just going to throw a curveball, right? And I'm going to throw a curveball that's going to be, you know, start at 3 o'clock and go down to – seven, eight o'clock, right? I can throw you a pull draw. So in that same way, the ball is spinning off the club very similar Correct. as a curveball is in baseball, Thank right? You. So in that same sense, I know what that feel feels like, and it's crazy to think that the feel out of my hand translates to the feel of the club in my hand. That's why... And I think that's my <clears throat> That's why Thomas Twitty said golf is a game of throws. It really is. And so the better you are at throwing, the better you are at doing all these different things. So... Um, That kind of brings me to kind of an interesting conversation, which is, A, how we build golf swings here. How I build golf swings is around whatever it is that you can do. Um, And I think that's one of the things that makes me unique. Like, you know, a lot of people talk about, like, you know, swing your swing. We're going to build your swing. I was like, no, truly, authentically, I have to find what is fundamentally your core movement pattern and what we can build or not build on that. Um, And there will be limits to how good you can get. Um, you know, it's each player is unique in that. Some players are just going to be players that hit the ball high. Some players are just going to be players that hit the ball low. Like my swing hits lots of knockdowns. It makes me really crazy good with my wedges, right? We've talked about this. Um, <clears throat> but, and for you, like that little draw pattern is going to be really good, but you need to learn how to cut it to be able to maintain control of said draw. Otherwise, it'll get out of, ca- it'll get out of hand. You know what's interesting? Pun intended. And, um, <laughs> I was never able – it's so interesting. I, I, I'm saying this out of pure curiosity. I have no idea if this is going to make sense or if it's not. But I was never a pitcher, okay? I was never – I mean, I was, but, like, I was never a pitcher at a high level. It was only, like, when I was playing, like, 14-year-old ball. But what's interesting is that I can throw, like, these curveballs, these sliders, these cutters, these ones that are, that are curving from right to left, right? But I – couldn't really throw like a cut fastball that moved from like left to right 
or any of these ones that move move this way. Now, there's not many pitches in the baseball arsenal that move from left to right if you're a right-handed thrower. Opposite, it's it's opposite for do. the other, right? <clears throat> but the, the crazy thing is about the baseball is if you want to throw that pitch, you're going to be holding it like this. This is called a two-seam grip because your hands are on both seams, right? The two seams. But when you throw it, when you're releasing the ball, you're actually putting more pressure on this index finger than you are on your middle finger. Mm -hmm. And so there's about 20% here and about 80% here, and that would cause the ball to move this way, right? And then cut on the inside. I was, never, so really, I was never really able well, to it's throw one that. Of the, I've, I've heard it's one of the hardest pitches to throw. Yeah, that cut fastball. I mean, that's why it's Mar not great on the elbow either. Yeah, that's why Mariano Rivera was so good. He was able to throw that, but it was a it was a cut fastball the other way from right to left, if I'm if I'm remembering that correctly. Um, and so that's in the same way you put eighty percent of your pressure here and twenty percent of your pressure here. Right. So, to that point of like, what is your golf swing? I did this today with a with a young man. I was like, so on our big whiteboard that we now have in the studio, I was like, all right, George, I want you to write like, what is your golf swing? Like truly, authentically, what it, what is it? Like, all right, you're I'm a draw player, great. Like, what else? Like that's super like broad scope. That's like saying I am tall, right? Like I am a golfer, <laughs> right? Like that's <laughs> the second thing to to that piece. And so, when you decide what it is that you're gonna, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I love Lamb. That's good. Uh, but so. For instance, um, we had these six elite juniors for from, golly, jeez, look look at this. I can't even get through an awesome comment I'm about to make. <laughs> I got the podcast regulars on the couch. I kind of I know I know he had he had some fun. Um, <laughs> so, anywho, I, we have these six kids, and we um, I'll tell you about what we did with them in the start of the round to kind of really expose them, which helps us find what kind of player they really are. Uh, but we did some work on the track man and I just had him hit a couple of shots and I was like, I want you to hit five or six shots and we kind of tracked what their shot pattern was I said, okay, that's great. It's drawing to the left. Well, I want to hit a cut. I was like, well, you just hit me six draws in a row trying to hit your stock shot. Why do you want to be? They were, they a, why were do you probably be a, very pretty, like 15, like 10 yards from left yeah, to right. So they were, they were sorry, between right five and 15. That's awesome. And it was great. And we're like, well, why do you want to be a fade player? Well, I, you know, oh, I don't want to hook it. I was like, well, there's a difference between not wanting to hook it and wanting to fade it. And so um, I, I, I kind of went further. It's like, okay, that's great. Well, if you don't want to hook it, I said, well, do you know how to hit a knockdown? She said, yeah. I said, okay, why don't you hit me, just hit me some knockdowns? Like her dispersion pattern right to left tightened up so much and her distance control tightened up and she hit it just a little bit farther. Knockdown draws? Just she it's just asked her to hit a knockdown. Just knock down just shots. Just hit a just hit a knockdown shot. Just hit it flight it down, hit it five to ten yards shorter. Oh. She had far more control over her distance and her direction was tighter and she didn't hook it. So she she's didn't have just any hooks. Be a knockdown I was like, Well, what's wrong with you hitting a knockdown? And it's not as cool. Yeah, well, <laughs> you know, I'm a long hitter. I was like, Okay, I got that. That's fine. Now she tried to hit it on the golf course, but she missed applied how the hole was set up which isn't the time that she should have hit that shot and the location of the pin relative to where they were wasn't great for her to hit that shot and so it's like see it doesn't work i was like no no no, you missed some other information and so like we're pulling these layers back what kind of player are you we had another young man there and he's uh he's like i want to be a fade player i was like okay great well can i see hit fades and he's hitting these just weak slices that are going nowhere i was like what so why do you want like what what do you want to be as like so he's working okay I'm working on this technique it's like I don't care about your technique we're just hitting shots like I'm not even touching your technique we're all sitting there with all the other kids watching and the parents and the coaches watching let's uh real quick before you go on uh -huh. let's let's relay this to to uh, our analogy earlier with the baseball right if you said like hey you can you can throw this let's just say we're playing base uh like golf with a baseball right hey uh Jack, like, why would why would we? Jeez, oh how do I say this? Why would you want to throw like our student if you can throw like me and get it closer to the hole? Does that make any sense? Like, why are you choosing to hit this weak 
shot just to just for the sake of hitting it and saying you can hit it both ways if you can use your strengths and be so much better well because there's this chase of like having this perfect golf swing exactly that's my whole point it's like right and that's as i've gotten better on the golf course i mean i posted a 75 a 78 and then i had like a bad round that i texted to you that i actually shot 80 like it was like a really like it's working and what am i not hitting i'm hitting or what am i hitting i'm hitting the shots that i know how to hit i'm hitting these draws i'm biasing them correctly and i guarantee you in any of those rounds i might have hit one like straight to cut shot in that whole time right so it's like why why do we need that why do we need both why do we need both you you need both at the highest level correct correct but and even at the highest level, you don't. You're still have to use them hitting. All the time. No, you're still hitting your best and most favored shot pretty much everywhere. Um, now, for me, I can shape the ball a little bit more when I'm a as a knockdown player. I can shape shots more because they're not in the air as long. They're lower on the ground, and so like any movement isn't as bad. So, but that's to my advantage. Um, but even then, I'm trying to hit the shot that feels the most comfortable when I'm hitting knockdowns. But with that being said, so I looked at him and I said, well, new school is, yeah, you're giving me the technique stuff you're working on. That's not what you're here for. That's not what we're doing. I said, why don't you just like, and I, here's the hard part. I knew he's not swinging the right swing, right? But they're not here for technique. They're for here for learning how to hit shots, which we told him we were going to do. We we're going to teach you how to hit shots. That's part of like play golf, play the game, not just golf swing. Like we got to get off the swing. And so <clears throat> we asked this young man, I said, uh, why don't you just try to hit it as high as you can? And he's like, huh? I was like, just hit it as high as you possibly can. And he starts hitting this. The first one's this high pole, which is fine. Like and John's like, man, dude, sign me up. I'll show this kid how to hit it high. But – now, this is me going all instinct, and so I kind of got the question, like, so why would you ask him or her to do that? I said, I don't know. I, I just knew if I asked them to do that, they're probably going to have control over the golf ball. And so this kid starts hitting these high, like, super high, soft fades that are beautiful. Like, they are flying high, far. They're going 20 yards further by him trying to hit it higher, and he's, like, so, like, perplexed in his head, like, how's this happening? I said, that's old school. Old school used to use the ball flight to fix the swing. So I fixed his golf swing, but in a way that he could go right out there and play like, I'm just going to try and hit this as high as I can. And it's all feel. All natural. Like, however it would be natural, that was the pull draw for you when we first started. Now, it's more refined than that now, but, like, just give me a pull draw. Like, just be all feel oriented. And I, I explained to his dad, I said, call me in two years. Have him talk to me in two years. No. Talk to me in two years, and I'll explain to you what's happening. So part of the reason why he's making the swing that he's making is because his body's still trying to swing like it was. He went through a big growth spurt over the last year, went about eight inches in a year, similar to what I went through. And so his body's still trying to get into the places. Like his eyes are trying to still be the same distance from the ball. Like there's there's lots of things. The arms are trying to swing the same way, the length of the backswing, the f- way the finish sits, the way his legs work. Like there's so much about the golf swing that's trying to still be like he's five foot six Let and me he's six here. foot one. So when you give him a feel, the feel doesn't necessarily care about the old. It just cares about what you executing are trying the to shot. executing the shot that you're trying this to hit. This is the athlete kicking in, right? Yes, yes. And so he's hitting this is why beautiful you shots. need the baseball. This is why you need the athleticism. This Correct. is why you need all of this is so you can change. A lot of people who are unathletic and go to swing coaches and spend tons of money doing it, they're basically having to get a new model every right. single year. But you don't have to if you're going to use the athleticism. Well, I don't want him to play baseball because it's going to ruin his golf swing no. or vice versa. I was like, what, you, what you're actually saying is like, hey, your kid's not actually that athletic. Like, He's going to get ruined by playing another sport. You know what oh, another myth like, is in the no, baseball community? The An- athletes. Another myth in the baseball community is if you're a right-handed hitter, that you should learn how to play golf left-handed. No, it's total garbage. I know. And, and we know that now. But I feel like ever since yeah. like the, the era of like TrackMan and actual data coming out, like 
and people You're gonna hit using way multi, harder, multi right? sports and having golf gain in popularity. A lot of those like golf baseball myths have been debunked. And I actually had some guy ask me on the course the other day because like he was listening to the podcast and he goes, "Man, how did it take you to? How long did it take you to you know lose your baseball swing and get your golf swing?" And, I was like, "You and, still have your baseball well, swing." And I told this, I, I told this to him too. I said, "Scott told me this when I first started playing is baseball and." Baseball and golf are not all that different. You just take the the impact point, rotate your hands, and put it down on the ground. That's, that's it. <laughs> that's literally pretty much all that's it is. It. That's pretty much it. And if you think about it, the baseball swing is you know is is very uh, 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 like parallel to the ground, right? And just take that same swing plane and just tilt it, just tilt it. So that's you're it. hitting so you're hitting the ground instead of the ball in midair. That's literally it. <laughs> and guess what? Our ball isn't moving. <laughs> Our ball's yeah, sitting it's even easier. Um, but like, so he's hitting these awesome shots. Fast forward 10 days. Today's Wednesday, right? So I got this yesterday. Week and a half. So they left on Sunday of the previous week. So we're not even, we're not even 10 days. So he's got a two day event, Monday, Tuesday. Shoots, uh, 73, 74 wins a two day event. (laughs) Just trying to hit it high. That's all we did. And we talked a little bit about body language. Like we spent 15 minutes. We do a whiteboard moment with every kid. Like what are your takeaways before you leave here? We're not even going to send you our analysis. What are your takeaways? Because it doesn't matter what I have to say. Right? And so we take them through like what do you want? What's keeping you from having it? What do you need to change to get it? What are you willing to do what's required? So like we can work through those four. I said one of the things for you, and I said fundamentally for you, you have to change your body language. Is this the same guy? Same kid. Same guy, yeah. He's 6'1", six, 6'2", six, thin as a rail, thinner than me. He's like half my thinness. He's like you before you put on your weight. <laughs> right. <laughs> and like... Good weight, by the way. I said, stand up tall. Like, Erica walked into the room at that point. She had just gotten here and stood next to him. I was like, Erica, come up here. And you could just see him retreat. I'm like, dude, she's 5'4". You're 6'2". Stand up. Like, And the moment he actually stood up and rolled his shoulders back... He went from looking like he was 5'8", five, 5'9", five, which he wasn't, even slouched over, he was still probably six feet tall. But he went from looking like he was 5'8", to looking like he was 6'4". There's, like, a, there's a saying, Thanks, too, Daniel. it's called the 738-55 rule, where it's 7% what you say, 38% how you say it, and 55% body language. Mm. I think that's, that's really, I think that's good. I think that's really good. I think that's solid. I mean, think Wait, about... Okay, so say those again. 7%... Oh, well, here, toss me the ball, though. <laughs> you have to have um, the ball to talk. 7% seven, seven percent <laughs> what you're saying. 7% what you're saying. 38% how you say it or tonality. Ooh, okay. And then 55% body language. I would agree with that. I think that's great. Right. John, what did you have to say? Jordan Peterson, 12 rules for life, rule number two. Stand up straight with your shoulders back. Yep, mm. see? I mean, I, I love that. Yeah, I love that. Well, it's one of the things Erica's leading all these kids, 30 of them. And they're 11 to 17 years old. Half of them are taller than she is. That's great. Yeah, and yeah, like yeah. trying to get her to like, hey, I still need her to look bigger. Listen up. Right. <laughs> and so, but a lot of it has to do with how she projects her confidence. And like some of it's shifting the language. Like is like, I need more intonation in your voice. Right, that's the how you say it piece. Like you're saying all the right things. Give me some intonation, and give me a little force behind what you're saying with some emphasis in certain places. That's going to make you bigger, on top of the body language of you standing as tall as you can. It's also why I'm not standing next to her because I'm gonna I'm gonna crowd that and they're all gonna look at me and like, no, she's running it. I'm I'm behind. I'm back here. It's also why the best podcasters in the world are very, very, very good at choosing their words wisely and how they say those words, right? Because you can't give the other 55%. So you have to choose your words wisely and you have to say them with, yeah. uh, I guess, a good tonality. It's why I didn't really like how I spoke on this last Live podcast because I was like, I just don't know. Like, you can just tell, like, I'm just don't oh, I can, know. I can already tell the difference between... Oh, you, yeah. You like, I just have... I just, I, and it's actually... I think it's actually okay that it's that it just sounds so uncertain because that's how I actually feel. Like, it's authentic. Like, I just mm. don't know. Mm. and it's just like everybody's asking me for my opinion and like i guess my answer is like i'm kind of disappointed and i'm confused Mm. 
and I feel bad for some people. I wonder how that'll sound on the. Like, I wonder, uh, Tate. You'll have to tell us this. Uh, I wonder if. I wonder how that's going to sound. Like, I wonder if that's going to come off in a good way, or if that's going to come off in a. Oh, I'm going to turn the podcast off in twenty five minutes. I, I, I'm kind of okay if they turn it off because honestly, I don't think I'd, there's much for us to say other than like check the link that I'm going to put in the bio. Yeah, no, I, um, I agree with that too. But you know, it's learning how to play and truly play. They have to figure out who it is that they are as a player, not who it is they are as a person, but when that's part of it. But who they are as a player. Now, the who they are as a person. We have one of the other girls plays a victim mentality. Yeah. Um, plays a victim mentality a lot. And I was like, look, we got to get this out and we need to move from victim to victor. Victims blame, victors take ownership of every single thing. And the parents have been asking like, how can we help her? And like she had played after her first session with me and the, me coming on board as her primary coach. Um, she went and played an event, played terrible shot like, 87 like 91 87 or something like that and she's nowhere like she's way better than that she didn't know it at the time but like she's way better than that <clears throat> so dad went out and played around with her and like just asked her questions kind of like we do and i like i had to have the conversation with them after the fact i said here's the hard part you actually helped you actually ingrained the victim mindset because you had to ask the questions she has to start asking the questions like you can't help her ask the questions. I said, we have to put her on an Island. I'm the only one who can speak into the Island. I said, basically I want you to think of it like this, like the hunger games where you stick her out in this competition and she's either going to live or she's going to die. One of those two, she's probably going to get wounded a bunch. And like, I'm going to send in resources occasionally and be this voice that just kind of speaks aloud, but I'm not really going to do anything for her. I'm just going to, Toss in little tools. It's still going to be up to her to do something with them. You know what we call that? We call that enablement. Right. And the lucky part is the parents were asking enough to try to do that. But here's the thing. There's good enablement, and there's enablement that people think is good, and it's actually detrimental too. Right. So I asked her, I said, hey, um, what? Um, send me all your scores since we put you on the island, please. Uh in order here were the 18 hole rounds 86 87 this is when she started getting help 81 88 i was like we got to leave her on the island it's like this isn't working i was like just hanging with me 78 80 76 83 69 79 74 74 70 in order that's the way it was now here's our nine hole scores in order 39 38 41 39 40 36 34 so by living on the island by living on the island, she was able to figure it out on her own. She's won two events since. 74, 74, 78, 78. And the second one was under some injury on the shoulder that she was trying to rehab. And, like, she knows she didn't play her best because she, she knows she didn't fully commit to her shots. So for her, putting her on that island and forcing her to figure it out was the best way through for her to find her authentic swing. And dude, I wish I could have shown you the moment that we had with her on her technique when she was here 10 days ago. Oh, so the 74, 74, this is really tricky. So she did that two days after I'd given her a significant change in her motion, full commitment, fully in, like you got to lock in and own this. And she committed to it all the way through played great played two rounds like that's like that's playing golf you can't play golf swing and so you have to let them screw it up and figure out who they are as a player and sometimes they're in their own way they're trying to be something that they're not like but i hit it far i go for par fives and two i was like you're hitting it like well i have this 30 to 50 yard shot all the time well that means you're not actually getting to the par fives and two like you're trying, but you're you're literally ninety feet short at best, fifty feet or sorry, ninety feet, hundred and fifty feet short at worst. You know what's a great hole to describe that exact scenario is seventeen out here at Franklin Bridge. Cause even a long hitter like like myself, if I'm in a good position in that fairway, it's like it's a pretty tightly hit three wood to get to that green or at least right. get in a general area. And even if you lay up, you're probably not laying up in a great position because you're hitting it into that waste area where you got to chip up another, you know, 
15 yards uphill to get to right. the green. So it's like, all right, in that case scenario, the best way for birdie is just to lay up as close as you can to the water, hit on, putt. And and the hardest part was trying to get through to her. Like you hitting it farther isn't the thing that you actually need. Yeah, which you it, going for which par fives and two isn't what need you do. need. I everybody like, thinks they need to get longer. I was like, well, what are you going for the par fives and two for? Like, they're mostly fairway woods. Yeah. I was like, wait, a, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. And you're not getting to the green. Like, there's something you're missing. And so none of them play enough holes. I said, y'all need to be playing a hundred holes a week. And. The craziest thing for all of them, the way we expose it, they played terrible in the first round. We put them on a clock, shot clock, for every single shot that they hit. So literally like 40 seconds. Once the previous player's ball stopped on the green, you had 40 seconds to hit your shot. So if you, weren't all, like if you were one of the longer hitters and you didn't get up to your ball and weren't ready to go, if that ball came to rest, you had to walk the 30 yards or 20 yards to your ball, set your bag down, choose your shot, and go. Now, here's what makes it even more interesting. We took away their yardage books that they all had for the golf course, and they'd all have played here before. And we took away um, we took away their range finders. So they had nothing. Now, they have the three yardage markers on the, on the uh, cart paths, but that's it. But you only have 40 seconds, so you can't like run over and like look at it and walk it off and do all that. You don't have time. I want to do this. I it's mean, like, so hard, dude. Like, and you're so out of your routine. Now, luckily, like I'm do a modified version of this. <laughs> so, dude, Elijah and I struggled. Now, I did really well through like 10 or 11 holes, and I played with them. We played with them. I think I fatigued a good bit just because I'm not prepared to play and I'm not used to playing that long. It Elijah struggled because we. Elijah's default is to take a little more time and think through his shots, but once he's thought through it, he goes fairly quick. This is where I would thrive, dude. And so, <laughs> dude, I was, I was two back of some of the boys. I made like three bombs coming in and no range finder the whole time. Here's what got really cool. So the next round we allowed them to use the range finders on the par threes. Oh yeah. And we had the coaches with us, the, RSA team, they were covering up the yardage markers on the par threes so they didn't have them on the par threes. And so That's we great. allowed them to have the range That's finders great. on the par threes in the second round. So we played, uh, yeah, we basically played 36 holes real fast. So that was the only hole we allowed them to use it. They used it there. Then we gave them, uh, allowed to use range finders on approach shots on par fours the next round. They didn't use them. They selected to not use them. Oh, yeah, and we took away aim point, too. I think we took away all of their, like, stuff that they use. Like, we took away all of that. We're going all raw, all feel. They didn't – we played 72 holes in two and a half days, and they didn't use range finders when we gave them to use them except for on the par threes. Were they uh, Were they able to line, the, line their ball up on the green? Yeah, they were able to, but you had 40 seconds when oh, it was your turn to oh, go. Oh, yeah, fair enough. Okay. Right? Like, you got to You got to go. Yeah. And well, we did a podcast a about this a while ago, talking about why you don't need rangefinders, right? Mm -hmm. And why there are like, like <sighs> we stripped away yeah. the crutches that they mm -hmm. use. Yep, because they use that. Like, oh, I just don't have enough information. No, you actually have plenty. You're just not using it because your brain has learned how to shut off something that it's really good at doing. We talked about this. Don't outsource your brain to something that it's great at doing, right? Like, I'm not outsourcing the best technique instruction, like the best players that come through us or the most challenging cases that come through, those the person that gives those lessons is me because I'm the best, right? And that's what I'm great at doing. I'm not going to outsource that to someone who's not as good at that, even if they have more tech than I have. I'm still the best. So I outsource the things at which I'm not best at using. So, uh, But it was really cool to see them do that they're playing a lot more holes. A couple of um, – Elijah got one of the girls under par, um, caddying for him on one of the rounds, which is great. Um, so it's just like learning how to play. When I, I had a guy come in the other day. It was like, you know, I'm pretty good at the core strategy thing, and I just stopped him in his tracks. This is not me, as you know, like in character. I said, all right, we're going to stop right there. Like let me just tell you this. I've got two books on it. I've got a podcast with over – 250 episodes basically at this point on the fact that people do not know how to play 
the game at a deep level. You do not have good core strategy. I'm not going to let you have that. No. I know I'm being tough on you, but like that goes for everybody. I don't care if you were 15 shots better. You suck at core strategy, okay? So like, let's just start there. What would you like to work on? This is the first lesson. That is not me to like, boom, come right at you. I was like, no. Like, I just fundamentally believe this stuff. It's time for me to start speaking up and saying it. Like, you suck at core strategy, and it's okay to say that because you do. Now we can make it better. What would you? This is my last little argument here. Is like, what would you say to a player like Bryson DeChambeau? Who he's like, all right, give me my number forty six. I know exactly where that feel is in my in my wedges. Uh, I think that's a specialty case, but I would even ask the question: What if you took that away from him? Mm. I still think he'd do pretty well. I think he'd do great. Yeah. Um, I can't say for a fact that he would do better without all that stuff, but I think you'd be surprised. Um, Elijah Elijah said something really interesting. He said people are trying to find a reason why that they're bad at like, Oh, if I just use aim point, I'm going to be better at, and I'm not anti aim point. I'm just, I'm not pro aim. If I get that new driver, you know, I'll definitely be able to. Right. And you know what? In some cases it is a new driver. Like we found that Micah needs a new driver to get his spin rates down. But that's very, that's a different, very different. And if we're building your whole golf game, we should look at all of the pieces, including the fitness, including the hydro, including the lifestyle, including all of that stuff. Right, right, right. And so, it's just like they just don't know what they're doing at the end of the day. Like we have to teach people how to play. You have to learn how to play. Go out on the golf course with Elijah. Read both of my books. We're going to Colorado to do a talk and to take people through what we did this weekend with these kids. Like exactly. their scoring average was 76 and a half. And right now that scoring average as a group is – close to three shots lower, which is our goal for them. There's so many – I know Scott only tells some of these stories sorry, on the podcast, but you you guys would have no idea how many times Scott texts me or, like, just calls me randomly if I'm out here, and he's like, dude, I have to tell you this. And he's like – and he's just so excited that this stuff is actually working. But it's so contrary to what is being taught in golf right now. Right. And so I think that's why you got you get so excited about this is, like, Holy crap, dude, we have something here, and it's working with players, young and old, male, female, whatever you want to do. It's working for everybody, and that has to be a reason why it's good. Right, and you know, you can watch. There's core strategy starting to show up on Instagram and stuff and on TikTok. Not the way we teach it, though. But, dude, it's so, like, surfacy and never gets to the root. Like, we got to get to the root cause of these problems, and it's why these kids... Like, we've got three tournament wins, multiple rounds under par, and we're talking about kids whose collective scoring average was 77 and a half. I said 76 and a half earlier. It's wrong. And they're now scoring average is now under two and a half shots lower at the worst right now, collectively as a group. Like, they've learned by being here for two and a half days of a deep dive. We're with them from eight to nine every day for the first two days, and then it's a half a day. But, like, we are going to pull it apart so that you can see. And, dude, they struggled so bad. When we removed all of those things, they got to see that they don't actually know how to play. And the reason why we did speed like that, oh, and they got penalty strokes, dude. We dinged them hard. Like, if you went over that 40 seconds, boom, penalty stroke. We told you about it right away. Yeah, so um, we got to wrap this up. Sorry, taking too long. I'll give you all a nice tip, I promise. Um, But, uh, yeah, (laughs) so, you know, it's – People got to learn how to play, and we got to go deeper. It's not just, oh, I need to hit an eight iron instead of a six iron here, or whatever, or nine iron. Like it's just, let us take you deeper. Let us show you how. I think the the last thing that I'll say here um, is that from somebody who has gotten to who my my entire golf game is molded around Scott's teachings, quite literally. <laughs> and it's so funny how now I'm starting to feel the effects of them. Obviously, I know BPN, OP, and POA. But just two, we were talking about the tendencies of the pull draw, and now I'm hitting a draw so naturally, and I can control it. Like we're talking about the dial, turn it left, turn it right, find the middle kind of deal, and I can dial all of those exactly where I need. So now when I go out onto the course, especially here at Franklin Bridge where I know all the BPNs, it's like, all right, I know how to shape this thing into the BPN that I want, and I know how to control the distance, how to control the yardage. And it's funny, too, in a lot of my shots that are under 100 yards, I – I prefer not to use the range finder. I prefer to feel it in the club that I want to hit, right? I've got a 58, a 54, and a 50. And I can feel 
the trajectory. I can feel the distance. I can feel the movement. And I just think that's so interesting from somebody who's literally has his, his whole game molded around your teachings and your fundamentals and your teachings, not only course management, but also swing too. And I think that's just so interesting that that's starting to show up in my own game. So if y'all need anything out here at Franklin Bridge and you should need to learn how to play around the course, it's not as simple as just tracking how many greens and fairways you're hitting, right? It is about hitting it in the right place, even if it feels like the wrong place, and making sure that you're getting close to the pin and in the right spot on the pin. And that doesn't always mean putting your ball under the hole, for the love of God. <laughs> Please stop doing that. Don't just like, put it under the hole for the sake of putting it under the hole. Don't be afraid to go deeper in understanding. It, the game is so much more beautiful there. Yes. Yes. And, oh, I'm not good enough. And yes, you are. You'll yes, start, you are. And, and this is, oh, gosh, I say this in real estate. Now I'm getting fired up. Uh, Come on, Jack. we got to wrap this podcast up. <laughs> every situation is different, right? Every situation yeah. is different. And so if you play the game in a standard way, you're not going to get the results you have, right? So playing yeah. here at Franklin Bridge is going to be different than playing at the ocean course, right? Like yep. the BPNs are going to be completely different. And that's where this model is so different is this model adapts to the golf course rather than just giving you a blanket statement of how you need to play the game because the golf golf game is just not that simple. No, it's not. All right, it's, I think that's a great place to wrap. It's complex and it's beautiful. Perfect. Well, thank you guys so much for listening to our little soliloquies. Here. I haven't even looked at the camera in this episode. No, it's all right. You're so fired up. It's all right. It's all right. Uh, but from Scott and Jack here at Franklin Bridge, make sure to listen to us on Spotify, Apple Music, YouTube, wherever you're listening to this. Make sure you like, subscribe, follow, leave us a five star review. We said we're going to give away a free round of golf here at the bridge. If you guys leave us a five star review on Apple, and if you're on Spotify, go over to S Hassey Golf and uh, give us a recommendation for where we need to do play with the pod this summer if you can give us a recommendation on instagram or leave us a five-star review on uh, apple music uh, or apple podcast we'd really appreciate it and you'll be entered in to win that free round so from scott and jack here on the back porch of franklin bridge we'll see you on the next one it's been the no mulligan podcast peace There's one rule.